On this episode of Black Girl Gone, we tell the story of 26-year-old Paris Hobson, who disappeared on Christmas Day 2019 from Massillon, Ohio. The day Paris vanished, she had been visiting her grandparents for the holiday. According to her family, Paris seemed distant that day. She told her mother she was going for a walk to clear her head, but Paris never came back. All of her belongings were left behind, including her cell phone and ID. Two years later, Paris is still missing. What happened to Paris Hobson? Did she leave on her own, or did something happen to Paris? This is is Paris's story. A year before Paris Hobson disappeared, her brother was killed in a tragic car accident. Paris, like the rest of her family, took his death hard. And so when Paris vanished on Christmas Day 2019, you can imagine that her family was more than devastated. It's now been more than two years since Paris was last seen, and her family just wants answers. Even if they found out that Paris is no longer with us, they just want some sort of closure. Like in every missing person case, not knowing is one of the worst parts of having a missing loved one. Paris Hobson was originally from Maslin, Ohio. She was raised by her mother, Rochelle, and she had a younger brother named Perry. The people that knew Paris best said that she was very intelligent growing up and had a lot of goals in life. In high school, at Maslin Washington High School, Paris was a good student. And friends of Paris said that she was always a good time to be around. There was never a dull moment when Paris was around. After graduating from high school, Paris attended Cleveland State University, where she majored in social work. And in the years after college, Paris had a few jobs, but she also started an event planning business. By all accounts, Paris had a happy life and was very much looking forward to achieving the goals that she had set for herself. But in 2017, everything changed when tragedy struck the Hobson family. On June 16, 2017, Paris's brother, Perry Hobson Jr., was 22 years old when his car was involved in what would turn out to be a fatal car accident. Rochelle, Paris and Perry's mom, in a recent interview with ID Still a Mystery, recalled getting a phone call that day from her mom. Rochelle said that her mom told her that state troopers were at her house telling her that Perry's car had been in a car accident. At around 6.15 a.m. on June 16, 2017, Perry's red Oldsmobile Alero passed another car in a no-passing zone and caused a head-on collision with another car. Perry was still alive, but he was badly injured in the accident. The occupants of the other car had sustained minor injuries after their car flipped over. And according to reports, Perry was on his way to work when the accident took place. But Perry wasn't driving. Now, the car that was involved in the accident was Perry's car, but for whatever reason, he wasn't driving. And whoever was driving had fled the scene after the accident, leaving Perry in the passenger seat clinging to life. Perry was unconscious when paramedics arrived, and so he could not identify the driver. At first, police also could not identify Perry, and because the car was registered to him, they assumed Perry had been the one who fled from the car. In a 2018 article in The Independent about the accident, Harris recalled police coming to her home and asking her if she knew where her brother was. She, at the time, had no idea that her brother Perry had actually been in a medically induced coma and with machines breathing for him, unable to identify himself. Now, Perry had survived the accident, but he had sustained life-threatening injuries and was placed on life support. Days and weeks went by, but Perry's condition did not improve. Now, at this time, Rochelle was living in Columbus, and so that's where Perry was transported, and he was in a hospital there. Paris was still living in Massillon, and so she moved to Columbus to be closer to her mom and her brother. For months, Perry remained on life support and eventually was put in hospice care. But after almost a year, Perry Hobson Jr. died. He was only 23 years old. Perry's death was very difficult loss for both Paris and her mom, but the fact that the person who had been driving her brother's car had not been found haunted Paris. Police had opened an investigation into Perry's accident and were trying to find out who was responsible, but they had been unable to identify the driver. And so Paris had decided that she was going to find out who was driving her brother's car the day of the accident. After Perry's death, Paris was determined to figure out who had been driving the car. 
Paris was relentless and she began to narrow down the possible suspects. She knew that the person driving the car had to have been someone that Perry knew and trusted because he wouldn't have let just anyone drive his car. But just months after Perry passed away, the Hobsons were shocked to learn that Perry's mangled car was being used as a display at a local high school as part of a drunk driving awareness campaign. Paris and her mom were very angry. And Paris was featured on a local news station in Cleveland to discuss the issue. In the interview, Paris tells reporters that her brother had been in multiple healthcare facilities over the previous 10 months fighting for her life. And their family had just begun to cope with the fact that Perry was not coming back. And now his car was being used as a prop. Not only was the family not asked permission for the car to be used, they were under the impression that it was still in police custody being held as evidence. But even more than that, Perry was not drunk. And so to use the car that he owned for that campaign was extremely insensitive. During her interview, Paris said this. Anyone that was responsible for displaying the car, I feel, should be held accountable for the pain and grief that they have brought upon our family and our friends. The high school removed Perry's car and it was returned to the impound lot. But it's not clear if the family ever received an apology. As expected... Paris was taking the death of her brother hard. He was her only brother, her younger brother, and having him whipped away in such a tragic way had been very difficult for Paris. His death had changed her in many ways, but Paris still seemed to be really hopeful. Scrolling through Paris's Facebook page in the year before she vanished shows a very hopeful person. Paris posted a lot on Facebook, and her posts are filled with memes about looking forward and being grateful. In February 2019, she posted a status saying that her goal was to remain positive in 2019 and take the good with the bad because in all things, there's balance. Throughout 2019, Paris was heavily involved with the American Legion Department of Ohio. The American Legion is an organization that provides assistance for veterans and military personnel and their families. And judging from her post on Facebook, it seemed to be something that Paris was very passionate about. Despite the death of her only brother, Paris appeared to have been trying to find happiness in any way that she could, whether through work or through family and friends. But she still was very much trying to figure out what really happened to her brother two years before. After all of that time, no one had come forward and no one had admitted to driving Perry's car that day. And so even though Paris had to go on with her life, finding the driver was a priority. As 2019 wound down, Paris and Rochelle planned to go back to Massillon for Christmas. From the pictures from 2018, it appears like getting together for the holidays was something that Paris's family always did. Their plan was to stay at Rochelle's parents' house. Rochelle said that her and Paris drove to Massillon on Christmas Eve. In, in the interview with Still a Mystery, Rochelle said that Paris slept most of the way. The drive from Columbus is about two hours, and Rochelle said that she wasn't really surprised that Paris was tired because in the days leading up to their trip back to Maslin, Paris had not been getting a lot of sleep. And the next day was Christmas, and Paris was acting strange. According to Rochelle and other family members that were around that day, Paris was not at all acting like herself, and you could tell that something was wrong with her. She was pacing the floor, and she just seemed to be really anxious. According to her family, she also kept looking out of the window as if she was possibly looking for something or someone. Now, it wasn't lost on Paris' family, including Rochelle, who herself had been dealing with a lot, that Paris was still struggling with Perry's death, and holidays are never easy after a loved one has died. Rochelle said that at some point, Paris was sitting outside alone. Rochelle said that she told Paris that she was getting ready to walk down to a neighbor's house for a quick visit. And Rochelle said that Paris said okay and then began to walk in the opposite direction. Rochelle asked Paris where she was going and Paris told her that she was going to the park. Rochelle said that she then told Paris that, you know, she shouldn't worry about whatever was bothering her and that she should pray about it. Now, she, of course, had no idea that that would be the last conversation that she would have with her daughter. Now, Rochelle returned from the neighbor's house and continued to enjoy her visit with her family. But after about a half hour had gone by, she realized that Paris had not returned from her walk to the park. Rochelle said that she began to text Paris to see where she was, but she wasn't getting a response. 
And after several minutes went by and Rochelle still hadn't gotten a response from Paris, she decided to walk outside. Rochelle said on Still a Mystery that when she went outside, she was walking past the car and she noticed that Paris's phone was in the car on the charger. Rochelle now knows that Paris isn't responding because she doesn't have her phone. And aside from her phone, Paris's wallet and ID are also in the car. Rochelle said that she immediately knew that something was wrong. She just didn't know what. Now, when Rochelle last saw Paris, she said that she was walking to the park. And so Rochelle got in her car and drove over to the park, hoping to find Paris there, you know, sitting on a bench or something. But when she arrived at the park, Paris was not there. Rochelle returned to her parents' house and waited. But after hours had gone by and Paris had not returned, Rochelle knew it was time to call the police and report Paris missing. After just losing her son, Rochelle, of course, is terrified and scared to death that something terrible has happened to Paris. But police, of course, would not take the report at the time because Paris was 26 years old and had been missing less than 24 hours. But Rochelle and the rest of her family ended up spending Christmas searching for Paris and worried sick that something terrible had happened to her. In the days after Paris disappeared, her family began to contemplate what could have possibly happened to Paris. She had been acting strange on Christmas Day, but it was also completely out of character for her to just leave. She had also left behind all of her personal belongings, including her phone. Rochelle returned back to the park to search again for Paris or any sign of her, but she found nothing. Rochelle said that she then turned to social media and asked if anyone had seen Paris and if they had to please contact her. But no one had seen Paris and Paris still had not returned. And so Rochelle decided it was time to contact the police again. According to Rochelle, when she spoke to police, she told them about Paris's strange behavior on Christmas Day. She said that something was wrong with Paris and that she had not been acting like herself. And so this time, police took the missing person report and entered Paris into the national database. But was Paris's strange behavior the reason why she disappeared? Or did Paris meet with foul play? When this investigation began, neither police nor Paris's family knew how long it would take for them to get those answers. On Christmas Day 2019, Paris Hobson walked away from her grandparents' home in Maslin, Ohio. She told her mother, Rochelle, that she was going for a walk to a park, but Paris never returned. And after days of being missing, police had taken the report of her disappearance. But as we know by now, taking a report does not mean that an investigation has begun. In the days following Paris' disappearance, her family was desperately trying to figure out what could have possibly happened to Paris. The thought of all the terrible possibilities, like maybe she hurt herself or maybe someone kidnapped her, I mean, each possibility just as scary, if not more than the next. But there was no signs of Paris. According to her mom, Rochelle, and other family members, Paris had been acting strangely that day. And so they initially were not sure if that had anything to do with her disappearance. But regardless of her behavior that day, it's obvious that Paris's disappearance on Christmas Day was completely out of character. Days after Paris had gone missing, someone had reached out to a member of Paris's family and offered to use their dogs in a search for Paris. The offer, of course, was more than welcomed by Paris's family, and they organized a search. According to Rochelle, about 30 to 40 people showed up to help look for Paris. But The search, unfortunately, does not find any signs of Paris. While Paris' family was organizing their own search efforts and passing out missing person flyers, Maslin Police Department was beginning to look into the strange circumstances of her disappearance. For police, it's always possible that an adult simply left on their own, especially when there's no signs of foul play that exist. But The fact that Paris had left behind her cell phone and ID was a red flag for investigators. Now, investigators by this time were aware of Perry's death the year before, and so they began to wrestle with the possibility that perhaps Paris had hurt herself and was no longer alive. Also, considering what her family had said about her demeanor that day, police asked Rochelle about Paris' mental health. 
They wanted to know if Paris had been suicidal or was on any medications. They also asked if she ever abused drugs or alcohol. But none of those things were true of Paris. She hadn't been struggling with her mental health. She wasn't suicidal either. Rochelle said that Paris sometimes had anxiety, but nothing debilitating. And she had been dealing with a lot in the wake of her brother's death and had been preoccupied for months trying to figure out who was driving his car. But she wasn't depressed in a way that would make those close to her worry that she might hurt herself. And Paris did not have a problem with drugs or alcohol. So that wasn't a factor in her disappearance either. With the little information they had, investigators decided to bring out cadaver dogs to search areas where Paris was last seen. They checked the park where Paris was supposed to have gone that day that she vanished. But they also checked the cemetery where Perry was buried. They thought there was a possibility that that Paris had possibly gone to visit her brother's grave and possibly decided to end her own life there. But there was no sign of Paris at any of the locations where the cadaver dog searched. As the days went by, Paris's family grew more and more worried, and the mountain of possibilities that existed about what could have happened to her were endless. With no leads coming in about Paris's whereabouts, investigators began to look deeper into Paris's life before she vanished. After speaking to Rochelle, detectives had learned that Paris's behavior in the weeks before she had vanished had also been kind of strange. Rochelle told investigators that a few weeks before Christmas, Paris said to her that if she ever had to leave, that Rochelle could keep her apartment. Rochelle, of course, thought it was a strange thing for Paris to say to her, but Paris did not elaborate on what she meant by leave for a little while. Rochelle said that she remembered asking Paris where did she think she was going. Then Rochelle said that a few days before Christmas, Paris said to her that If she ever needed to get into her phone, that she would give her the code. And she gave her the code. And that was also very strange. I mean, why would Paris tell her mom her password? It was really random. And for investigators, it left open the possibility that maybe Paris knew something that she wasn't saying. The things Paris said to her mom prior to her disappearance may have been strange at the time. But now that Paris was gone... Could she have been trying to prepare her mom for her disappearance? Investigators were not exactly sure. I mean, perhaps Paris wasn't planning to leave, but was instead afraid of someone. Detectives had turned to the local media to ask local businesses if they had surveillance footage. And not long after the ask, someone reached out to Rochelle on social media with a possible sighting of Paris. The person who messaged Rochelle worked at a local family dollar. And the woman told Rochelle that she remembered seeing Paris the day that she vanished. She said that Paris had come in and purchased a tobacco product. Now, this had been the first sighting of Paris that they knew about after her disappearance. And they were hoping that if it was Paris, perhaps she was with someone or they could get footage of which direction she had headed in when she left the store. Rochelle told Still a Mystery that the woman on the phone was adamant that it was Paris that she saw. Now, Rochelle gave the information to the investigators who went to the family dollars and pulled the footage from inside and outside the store. But when the footage was reviewed, it wasn't Paris. What Rochelle and the detectives thought was going to be a break in the case turned out to be nothing. Weeks went by with no credible leads and nothing surfacing about Paris's whereabouts. Again, investigators went back into Paris's life in the weeks before she disappeared to see if there was anything that could give them any information about what happened to her. There were rumors about what could have happened to Paris. And according to Rochelle, people told her things like they had heard that Paris had ran away and gotten married. She also heard rumors that Paris had checked herself into a mental hospital. But Rochelle said none of the information she was given had any evidence to support it. I mean, why would Paris run off and get married and leave her mom to grieve another child? It's not clear if mental hospitals were checked in the area, but Paris was not in a mental hospital either. A month after the investigation into Paris' disappearance began, Massillon Police Department announced that they were stalling the case because they had no new leads. They said that they would continue to accept information about the case and would leave the tip line open for anyone to call and report anything that may be helpful, but... 
Without any leads, they were at a standstill until they received a new tip. The weeks turned into months, and there were no signs of Paris and no credible leads about what happened to her. No tips had come into the hotline, and so police were getting nowhere. Four months after Paris disappeared, a private investigator joined the search for Paris, and he went back to Paris's activity in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. Now, the private investigator worked for an organization that helped smaller police departments like Maslin with investigations. And the private investigator learned that, according to Rochelle, Paris was getting closer to finding out who was driving her brother's car. She had been messaging people and calling people out about their possible involvement or knowledge about what happened that day. Now, the PI searched through Paris's phone to see who she had been communicating with, but there was nothing in Paris's conversations leading up to her disappearance that gave him any information about where she might have gone. The last test message in her phone was to a church pastor asking if there was going to be service that day. Now, it's not clear, but it seems like the private investigator did not find the communication that they thought they would regarding Paris's investigation into her brother's accident. Now, he knew based on what Rochelle had told him that Paris had been preoccupied with finding this person. But whatever the PI did not find led him to believe that Paris possibly had a second phone that she was using to communicate with people. Now, to me, that would make sense. I mean, if she was doing her own investigation, she wouldn't want people to have her personal number. And so perhaps she purchased another phone so that she could use it for that purpose only. I also noticed that when I went through Paris's Facebook page, which is public, that scrolling as far back as the beginning of 2019, I didn't see her mention her search for who was driving her brother's car. And so it's very possible that what Paris was doing in, you know, in terms of finding the driver of her brother's car was something that she wanted to keep separate from her personal and professional life. On her Facebook page, Paris shared a lot about her work with the American Legion and her posts were generally forward-looking and positive. And I can completely understand why Paris might have wanted to keep the two things separate. I'm not a person who likes to share things that are deeply personal to me either. And so if I was Paris, I probably would have done the same thing as far as what I shared or didn't share on social media. However, all of this is really just theory and speculation because there's no evidence that Paris did in fact have a second phone that she was using to communicate with people. During the private investigator's investigation in the weeks following Paris's disappearance, he also learned of a neighbor and friend of the family who claimed that he had saw Paris on Christmas Day and that she was looking back and forth like she was waiting for someone. Now, he didn't see her get in anyone's car, but that was the last known sighting of Paris that anyone knows about. The fact that Paris was looking out of the window of her grandparents' house as if she was looking for someone and then was later seen by a neighbor standing on a corner where she appeared to be waiting for someone caused the private investigator to look into the possibility that perhaps Paris was waiting for someone who ended up picking her up that day. The private investigator started to suspect that perhaps whoever was involved with Perry's accident was also possibly responsible for Paris's disappearance. He began to theorize that she may have been planning to meet with someone connected to her brother's accident. Like I said earlier, according to Rochelle, Paris was getting closer to finding out who was driving Perry's car. Rochelle said that she had been putting a lot of pressure on Perry's friends and maybe she got too close. The private investigator left open the possibility that perhaps Paris had scared whoever was driving her brother's car and that they knew that the only way to stop Paris from getting to the truth was to get rid of Paris. But police had been unable to find any evidence that suggests that this is the case. In fact, they have been unable to find any evidence to suggest that Perry's accident and Paris's disappearance are in any way connected. It's been over four years since Perry's accident, and police still have been unable to identify who was driving Perry's car that day. While the private investigator was looking into possible connections to Perry's accident, the Massillon police had been given new information about a relationship that Paris was in with a man that her cousin said was controlling and trying to isolate her from her family. It's not clear how much Paris's family knew about this man, but for police, the fact that he was exhibiting controlling behavior made him someone they knew that they needed to speak to. I mean, maybe that's who Paris had been meeting that day. 
maybe he was giving her a hard time about spending the holidays with her family, and that's why she was acting strange. But when police had searched Paris's phone, there was nothing that indicated that she had planned to leave or told anyone to meet her anywhere. With this new information about a boyfriend, the private investigator decided to take another look into Paris's communications. And he soon discovered an email that was sent just a few weeks before she disappeared. The email was to a lawyer and Paris was looking for information because she believed that someone was blackmailing her. Was the person blackmailing her the same person she had been dating or was it someone else? Now, there isn't any information about who this boyfriend was or whether police ever spoke to him. But this new information opened up a new possibility that if Paris did in fact meet someone that day, then it could have been whoever was trying to blackmail her and not someone connected to her brother's accident. But either way, the private investigator and the detectives on the case still had nothing but theories. Despite the bits and pieces of information that was coming in about Paris's life before she vanished, none of it had connected to any substantial theory and no leads or evidence came in to support any theory at all. Rochelle and the rest of Paris's family continued to search for Paris on their own and turned to social media for help in keeping Paris's story alive. But with social media, of course, comes trolls and lowlifes who prey on families dealing with tragedy. Her family had repeatedly gotten false information from people claiming that Paris was alive and even demanding money for her return. All of them complete lies. In October 2020, a false rumor began to circulate on social media that Paris had been located. The information was shared all over and a lot of people thought that Paris had been found. But it wasn't true. The family even received information that Paris had started a new life and was living in Hawaii. but. That was also not true. Investigators left open Paris's case, but in the years following her disappearance, there have been no new leads. They have said that they do not believe that foul play is involved, but do believe that Paris could be in danger. They just have no evidence that would lead them to any answers. Regardless of what happened to Paris, her family just wants answers, even if that answer is that Paris is no longer alive. They want to keep hope alive that Paris will return to them safe, but time is making it hard to keep that hope. In a 2020 interview with Dateline, Rochelle said, quote, We just want some answers. Something to help us find out where she is. Someone to come forward with some sort of information. I just don't want to lose hope. The disappearance of Paris Hobson is a very strange event. Paris seemed to have a lot of layers and possibly a lot of different things happening to her all at once. She was dealing with the death of her brother and the fact that the person responsible for his accident had not been held accountable. She was dating a man that was possibly abusive and controlling and she thought someone was trying to blackmail her. Did one of the people involved in these situations cause Paris's disappearance? Or did the totality of all these things cause Paris to just leave? The people that know Paris best do not believe that she would be gone this long if she was still alive. A cousin who she considered a best friend died after she disappeared, and so did her grandmother. The fact that she didn't return when those things happened to her family meant that Paris wasn't just somewhere living a new life, because her family believes that she would have returned. Paris's family is still looking for her. It's been two full years since Paris walked away from her grandparents' house and disappeared. Rochelle, while still mourning the death of her son, has been searching for her daughter for two years. Like I say all the time, people do not just vanish. Something happens to them. So there are answers out there somewhere about what happened to Paris. Somebody knows something, or somebody may have seen something that could help with the investigation into her disappearance. Paris Hobson was 26 years old when she vanished. She would be 28 today. She is 5 foot 2 inches tall and at the time of her disappearance weighed 220 pounds. She was last seen in Maslin, Ohio on Christmas Day 2019. She was wearing a black pea coat, a burgundy striped shirt, blue jeans, and black boots. 
she was also carrying a black purse. If you have any information about Paris or the circumstances of her disappearance, or if you live in Ohio or the surrounding area and think you may have seen Paris Hobson around the time she went missing, please contact the Massillon Police Department. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We will be back next week with a brand new story. Join us on Patreon for exclusive mini-sodes and ad-free episodes. As always, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram 